What does Shrek, ballrooms, watches and timepieces, and street gambling have in common? But of course, another episode of The Gilded Age. Hey everyone, this is D, Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today, I'm coming to you all with another episode of The Gilded Age, Season 1, Episode 2, Money Isn't Everything. Oh, the irony. This episode is directed by Michael Engler and written by Julian Fellows. So we start this episode off with our official opening credit sequence. I am such a big fan of opening credit sequences. I just think they're so fun and I love how in their individual way, depending on the show, it really can capture everything that the show represents and the subtext and just the overall vision of what the show is. I love how you can capture that just in those first few seconds. I love that opening shot of the railroad transitioning through the field over to the stock certificates. And then I really loved that final shot of the marble flowers opening and the logo and the moldings and the chandeliers. And I also really enjoy the theme. I've actually had it stuck in my head the past couple of days. And the theme, as well as the music for the series in general, is created by the Gregson Williams brothers which is comprised of first Rupert Gregson Williams, who's created both film and television scores for projects like Hotel Rwanda, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Veep, and The Crown. Then we also have Harry Gregson Williams, who composes music for video games, television, and films like the Metal Gear series, Electric Dreams, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Shrek franchise, and both Ridley Scott's most recent releases, The Last Duel and House of Gucci. And The Gilded Age marks their second collaboration as co-composers after the Hulu series Catch-22. Now, because so much went on in the first episode, I wasn't able to really flesh out this next piece. I wanted to mention that not only are we seeing the central members of each family, but considering the massive homes each of them own, we are also seeing the extensive staff that is helping maintain them. Much like Downton Abbey, which of course was created by our very own Julian Fellows. I have to be honest, I think the staff was the best part of Downton Abbey, with the exception of the Dowager Countess, played by the legendary Dame Maggie Smith. Not only were their individual personalities and backstories so interesting, but I love seeing how each of them had a hand in helping maintain the household and making sure things are running smoothly. So I'm actually really excited to see how that is going to play out on this series. And speaking of Steph, we open up with some really unexpected circumstances involving Mrs. Bauer, who was Agnes's German cook. We see her being threatened by this enforcer who demands that she pay up and have his money by the next day or else. I was just like, wow. <laughs> I mean, we are jumping head first into the drama this episode. We see Marion. She's being fitted for another dress. And she's also being accompanied by Peggy. We find out that Marion's lawyer, Tom, will be paying her a visit. And Peggy is also interested in seeking out his services. That's primarily because any black lawyer that she would speak to would most likely run back to her father, and he can't know about what she has planned. Now, we do know that Peggy has ambitions of being a writer, and considering that she was educated at the Institute for Colored Youth, in addition to her current position with Agnes, it's safe to say that Peggy has skills. And throwing a little background on the Institute for Colored Youth, it actually existed. It was founded in 1837, and it became the first high school for African Americans in the United States. And I love how they tied in that very significant piece of black history, especially knowing that even with the constant racism and rampant discrimination, that many of us in the black community were still achieving, were still pushing forward, were finding success. And I love hearing that, and I love seeing that represented in Peggy's character. Jumping over to the Van Ryn household, we see that Mrs. Bauer is still very much distraught over her current circumstances. And in addition to Mrs. Bauer, we have Bannister, the butler, Armstrong, Agnes's personal maid, Bridget, who is a housemaid, kitchen maid, and ladies maid, a triple header there. And then lastly, we have Jack, who is a footman and a hall boy. Whew, yes. <laughs> 
That's a lot of people to keep up with. But like I said, it's not unlike Downton Abbey. Bridget remarks on how handsome she finds Oscar Van Ryan to be. And Armstrong says, he only wants one thing from you. That's money and you haven't got it. She also says that Oscar is looking for the richest heiress that he can find. And when I heard that, I immediately thought, okay, that is going to pose quite the complication there. I wasn't able to mention it in the last recap, but we got a little reveal about Oscar at the very end of the last episode. And it was something I figured out at some point before it was revealed. And I was mainly basing that off of a comment that Oscar had made about Marion in the last episode. A dumpy spinster with a face like a cabbage and a figure to match. And there was obviously something very round about that statement. So, to make a long story short, turns out that Oscar enjoys swimming in the gentleman pond, if you know what I mean. And to make things even more complicated, he's involved in a liaison with John Adams, who just so happens to be the great grandson of John Quincy Adams, who was the sixth president of the United States. He also happens to be the gentleman that Agnes was pushing Marion to spend time with. Yeah, something tells me that all of this won't end well. Later, we find out that Marion has been invited by Mrs. Morris to take a stall for the charity bazaar, where they'll be selling different items to raise money. Over at the Russell household, George tells Bertha of his desire to meet with Alderman Patrick Morris, who happens to be Mrs. Morris's husband. So he asks Bertha to reach out and invite them over for dinner. Now, Mrs. Morris is not here for it, but surprisingly, Mr. Morris is somewhat intrigued because he knows that George is a force in the city, regardless of how some might feel. Later, Agnes and Ada are discussing Marion's prospects, and Agnes mentions how things clearly fell apart with John Adams and Marion, and I was like, <laughs> oh, you don't even know the half of it. Ada mentions Oscar taking an interest in Marion, and Agnes is like, skirt, skirt, <laughs> excuse me. Not only are they first cousins, but Marion, is quite broke. Now jumping over to the Russell household once again, with regards to their staff, we have Church, who is the family butler. We have Watson, who is George's valet. Mrs. Bruce, the new housekeeper. We also have Monsieur Bazan, their French chef, which is quite the extravagance. And Turner, who is Bertha's lady's maid. However, there's a lot more to how Turner feels about Bertha and her household, but more on that in a minute. Next, we see all the old New York wives gather together to discuss the charity bazaar. Marion suggests they ask Miss Russell for her help, and they're just like, it's gonna be a no for us. Mrs. Fain even says that she might have to report Marion to Aunt Agnes. Speaking of which, I neglected to mention in the last episode that Mrs. Fain, aka Aurora, she is actually Agnes's and Ada's niece by marriage which also makes her Marion's cousin by marriage. Next, we see Mrs. Bauer going down the wrong road by taking silver out of the cupboard and attempting to give it to the enforcer. But much like I suspected, he doesn't want silver, he wants his money. He smacks the silver out of her hand, she falls over and is trying to pick it up. And as that's happening, Peggy walks up and she's really confused as to what's going on. The enforcer lets Mrs. Bauer know have my money tomorrow or it's a wrap. At the Russells, we see George run into Turner, which as I said, is Bertha's lady's maid. He's looking for Bertha and Turner lets him know that she has gone with Mr. White to look at some pictures. She also says that women are an expensive hobby and she kind of taps his shoulder as she says that. I was just like, are we hinting at something, ma'am? But you can tell by George's facial expression that he is not swayed by her. And to give a little more background, Turner had already expressed in the first episode that she was barely tolerating Bertha. She resents the fact that Bertha doesn't have the manners of the real people, and it's something that she'll never learn. And she knows this because she used to work for one of them. So working for Bertha, yeah, no. But all I know is, considering that this is not Turner's first awkward run-in with George, all I see are red flags. Speaking of awkward run-ins, 
Marion has one of her own when both Tom and Larry show up at Agnes's house for tea. And judging from the look on Agnes's face, this is probably going to be the first and last time that that happens. <laughs> Later, we see Mr. and Mrs. Morris arriving at the Russells for dinner. And of course, Mrs. Morris cannot help herself. As soon as she steps into the house and she sees Bertha coming down the steps, she's like, should we kneel? <laughs> And dinner is more of the same. There are these not so subtle jabs and barbs being hurled back and forth between Mrs. Morris and Bertha. Mrs. Morris is taking shots at Bertha's house by saying the builder obviously wasn't afraid of decoration. <laughs> so then Bertha asks Mrs. Morris if Morris Hunt, who built their home, is a relation. Mrs. Morris says no. And Bertha says, oh, well, Morris is such a common name. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I love subtle, passive-aggressive, ten-out-ten situations like this. I think it is hilarious. Later, the Russells show off their ballroom, which is about as opulent and over-the-top as you can imagine. Bertha, in a not-so-subtle manner, offers the ballroom as an alternative if they're not able to find a suitable location for the charity bazaar. We see Marion and Peggy having a discussion about Mrs. Bower, and we find out that Mrs. Bauer has racked up $50 worth of debt from street gambling. And yes, you would think, $50? What's the big deal? Well, adjusting for inflation, $50 then would amount to about $1,366 today. Now, I am not broke by any means but you best believe I do not have nearly $1,400 be thrown away on some gambling debts. We see George and Mr. Morris having a conversation about the railroad, primarily regarding the new station that George wants to build in the city. And just like Bertha, in a not so subtle manner, George advises Mr. Morris and his associates to buy margin stocks and then sell them after the announcement. And when I heard that, I was like, Times have surely changed because you cannot get away with that anymore. That's why we have all these antitrust laws and anti-corruption laws for this specific reason. Later, we see Ada and Agnes having another conversation about Marion's future. And once again, those polar opposite personalities of theirs, they are clashing. Because Ada is very much the idealist and she is trying her best to push Tom and Marion together. Agnes is not having it, especially because she knows that she can't leave any of her money to Marion. It all has to go to her son, Oscar. And without the right marriage, Marion will be lost. Ada mentions that marrying for money is not a guarantee of happiness. And surprisingly, Agnes says, I don't want her to marry for money. I want her to marry for security, for support, and if possible, affection. And I really love hearing that because it shows that Agnes, underneath the steely exterior, really does care about Marion and she does want the best for her. And it's not necessarily wrapped up in just the rules, so to speak. And it's all the more significant because we know that Agnes's own experience with marriage was the complete opposite of what she's describing. We also see Peggy and Marion meet up with Tom at the Bethesda Fountain in Central Park. Peggy has a conversation with Tom, although we don't get to hear what they were discussing. And then later, we see Marion appealing to Oscar, of all people, to help pay Mrs. Bower's debt. As soon as I saw that, I was like, okay, I know that our options are limited, but I don't think this is the best person to go to. Oscar asks about being repaid, but instead of getting money back, he just wants Marion to throw a luncheon and invite Gladys. Now earlier, Armstrong was just talking about how Oscar is known as a fortune hunter. It's all starting to make sense. We also see Mr. Morris attempting to persuade his wife into using the Russell's ballroom for the charity bazaar. She's like, sorry, it's too late. And we can see Mr. Morris is quite nervous. He's like, look, I do not want to annoy George Russell at the present moment. I wouldn't either. Over at the Van Ryn household, Marion realizes that Ada is her saving grace in a potentially bad situation. And that's because she's decided to take on Mrs. Bower's debt herself. Marion and Ada also have a discussion about Marion's father 
And we see that Ada's experience with Marion's father was totally different from Agnes. She only has fond memories of him. And unlike Agnes, she's never had to just carry the weight of the world on her shoulders. And before she leaves, she lets Marion know that both she and Agnes want nothing more than her happiness. The next morning, we see Bertha reading the paper and discovering that the charity bazaar has moved from the 7th Regiment Armory to the 5th Avenue Hotel and she is taking it none too lightly. We go forward to the bazaar and all kinds of items are being sold. Flower arrangements with glass domes, leather gloves, watches and timepieces, fans, handkerchiefs, and much more. And let me say that I really love the production design here. I love it in general, but there was something very distinct about all the different items and the colors and just seeing this whole bazaar come to life. I really, really enjoyed that. And who should grace the bazaar with her presence but the much lauded, much acclaimed ruler of New York society, Mrs. Astor. She's there to officially kick things off and declare the bazaar open for business. We see a woman named Mrs. Chamberlain approach Marion's stall, and Marion wishes her a good day. And you can see the shock on Mrs. Chamberlain's face. She's like, uh, you are both polite and brave. <laughs> Now, at the last charity gathering in the first episode, both Mrs. Fane and Mrs. Morris warned Marion about Mrs. Chamberlain, saying that she's a woman that no one cares to know, and generally, one that no one speaks to. But we know that Marion is not here for the snobbery, the rules, the BS, none of that. So in return, Mrs. Chamberlain decides to support and buy several of Marion's handkerchiefs. But then they look behind them and they realize that Agnes and Ada have officially entered the bazaar. And Mrs. Chamberlain says, I suppose I should leave because it looks like you're about to pay for this exchange. <laughs> and it's more the same from Agnes. But she also tells Marion that there are terrible things in Mrs. Chamberlain's past that renders her unsuitable as an acquaintance. She even says Miss Chamberlain's money is tainted. And Marion says, well, if you were in just one room without heat or water, would you say the same thing? I was like, come on, Marion. <laughs> to not accept money that's being given to orphans and widows in a less fortunate, just based on someone's social standing, y'all can miss me with that. We also see Oscar, and once he finds out he's no longer responsible for the debt, aka he no longer has a bargaining chip, he decides to go ahead and introduce himself to the Russells. Now, we can see from Bertha's face that she's real iffy, but he's also a Van Ryan, so she's most certainly intrigued. And then we see George Russell come through. <laughs> and he decides to put Mrs. Fane and Mrs. Morris on complete and total blast in front of everybody for purposely not using his wife's ballroom. But he takes it a step further. He decides to ask one of the women at a nearby stall, how much money are you hoping to raise over the next three days? She says, oh, 30, maybe $40. He's like, boom, here's a $100 bill. Now, I already told you guys about inflation, right? And I told you what $50 was. So $100 adjusted for inflation would be $2,733. And it comes with the condition take everything on this stall and deliver it to my house on Fifth Avenue within the hour, and you need to dismantle your stall and get it out of here. Oh, ho, ho, but he's not finished. He goes to every single stall in the bazaar and does the same exact thing. As you can imagine, Mrs. Morris is not pleased. She even tells Bertha that this type of stunt will not impress the type of people she wants to win over. But Bertha is not swayed. She says, Mrs. Morris, this kind of stun impresses everybody. <laughs> and she's not wrong. <laughs> so, just that quickly, George Russell has single-handedly shut the charity bazaar down. <laughs> Even Mrs. Astor leaves. And before she does, she says, the lion has roared. I was like, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait now. Catching Mrs. Astor's attention? Hmm, not too shabby. And see, that's the whole thing about having money and having wealth. It does bring you a lot of attention and a lot of notoriety, whether people like it or not. 
And Mrs. Astor reiterates that to her daughter Carrie when she arrives home. Yesterday, I would have said he was a nobody. But today, I'm obliged to concede that he is a man to be reckoned with. Befriended? Ha! <laughs> no. But we will hear of him again. And that officially wraps up episode two, Money Isn't Everything. I don't have a lot to say here, although I did appreciate the first episode and I didn't have any like huge, huge issues with it. I think this episode really ramped things up, especially at the end. And now I'm even more intrigued to see how these characters are going to function together. I'm excited to learn more about the staff and what their backstories are. I'm excited to learn more about Mrs. Astor and what she's like outside of this persona. Like, what does she have going on? And I'm just ready for more of the twists and the turns and just the development of these characters and where their stories are going to go. Also, you guys can drop down and let me know what you thought of the episode. How do you feel about George coming through and shutting the Charity Bazaar down? Was it deserved? Was it doing too much? What do you think about Mrs. Astor? Let me know what you think about Marion and Tom and then Oscar and Gladys and that plot that seems to be forming. So yeah, please feel free to drop down and give me your thoughts. So once again, this is D, Movie Man, signing off and I'll see you at the movies. Thank you.